the Numinous Podcast with Carmen Spaniola. Hi there, and welcome to the Numinous Podcast, where we have interesting conversations with everyday folks about the mystery of life. I'm your host, Carmen Spaniola, joining you from the lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. It's commonly known as Victoria, BC. My guest today is Becca Piastrelli, author of the new book, Root and Ritual, Timeless Ways to Connect to Land, Lineage, Community, and the Self. It's a charming, full-color, illustrated guide to fundamentals of creating connection with spirits of place and ancestors. I describe it as a fresh update on modern self-directed spirituality because it foregrounds acknowledgement of how capitalist, imperialist, white supremacist, patriarchy have left many of us feeling cut off from belonging. It acknowledges how white feminism of the past and today has a tendency to appropriate spirituality from anywhere and everywhere. Becca's book clearly aims to recognize white privilege, give credit, and walk humbly on the spiritual path. But I'll let Becca tell you more about that in her own words. So Becca, what identities do you lead with? Hmm. Yeah, well, I am descended from white settlers here on the Turtle Island. They come from the lands of so-called Europe. Uh, so I am indigenous to the lands of um, the British, Welsh, Scottish, French, German, and Eastern European origins, Celtic, Pict, Norse, Anglo-Saxon people. I identify with she and they pronouns. Uh, I'm a straight cis woman in a heterosexual monogamous relationship, though I'm exploring my own queerness in these times. And I identify with the more than human world, the fungi and the trees and the stones and the waters and the bacteria and the critters, big and small. And uh, I identify as witch as well. Thank you. So I'm very interested to chat today, partially because we share a lot of overlapping um, ancestry and lineages in the sense that I, all those places that you named in um, Western Europe uh, also I, I too was a bit of a uh, Dr. Sykes nerd and uh-huh. did my Oxford ancestry, which you mentioned in the book. Um, what is it? Seven Tribes of Eve, I think was his book or something like that. Seven and, Daughters um, of Eve. Yeah. Seven Daughters. That's what it was. And, um, and I actually got the last, I submitted to get my um, ancestry. This is for, for listeners who aren't familiar with the, the, uh, Oxford ancestry approach. It was going back to mitochondrial Eve or like going back to our um, ancient, ancient ancestors to discern who were the matriarchs of your lineage. And, uh, and so this is mentioned in your book, Becca, that you come from Helena's lineage and mine is the one right next door, Velda. So mm. similar Western European, but with more sort of Spanish, um, et cetera. Uh, and I put my submission in and uh, Dr. Sykes had just passed away. He had just died. This oh. was like, and they said, but you're going to, you're our last one. <laughs> so they took a break. I don't know if they're still doing it. It's in your book, but they were like, yeah, we're, we're putting this in and then we're like pausing the program. Wow. I know. I know. So for folks who were interested in that that piece, it's like everybody should be following Oxford uh, Ancestry to see if they're still um, processing those uh, submissions. But um, I was very happy to have them say, yes, we're, the lab is still open. And then they went on hiatus. But um, anyway, so for several reasons, I thought, oh, this person, not only do we share lineages, but we've also found similar pathways to explore lineages, because there's Mm -hmm. only so many people who know about um, the Oxford Ancestry approach. Anyway, so we're going, I went way back thousands of years there, but I'd like to go back to your own 
uh, childhood. Tell us a little bit about your own spiritual upbringing. When did you become aware of wanting to belong to something greater than just the human world? Hmm. Yeah, I share about this a little bit in the beginning of the land section of my book, um, where I come clean (laughs) and say that I wasn't raised with a crinkly eyed grandmother who like showed me the ways of the land and how to read the rain clouds in the distance and how to can tomatoes or anything like that. No, I was a suburban child of the nineties, uh, who, I mean, if I can like squint my eyes, I can remember a wonder and enamorment enchantment with the living world and that quickly got swallowed up by suburban modern life, Nickelodeon television, boxed mac and cheese, Taco Bell after church, which got me to go to church, um, the mall, mall culture. <laughs> yeah, like shopping, makeup, uh, beepers, then cell phones, then Facebook, you know, like that was that was the thing. And I had a family that you know, our vacations were national parks and camping and I was just, I hated it. (laughs) I really (laughs) hated it. hated hiking. Um, So my story happens in my mid twenties when I, I just simply felt called. I had done all the things. It felt like I had done all the things and the stuff that were prescribed in one paradigm around quote success and there's this phrase, climb to the top of the ladder and realize it was leaning against the wrong wall. Stephen Covey. Uh, Stephen Covey. <laughs> yeah. So that happened, right? That happened. And um, honestly, it was like farmer's markets all of a sudden felt cool. And then, you know, when you go in a grocery store and someone has really lovingly um, displayed the produce, mm-hmm. whereas if you go in maybe another grocery store, where it just feels like kind of dead and unloved tomatoes and lemons. Mm-hmm. So I started just being really, there was a grocery store, a local co-op where I lived in the city that I just like love to hang out in the produce section. And so it was like little things like that, truly that little. Uh, my love of like historical period um, movies <laughs> and watching like the witchy herbal hedge witch type folk and being more interested in that and like what the set designer did for their little huts. Do you remember any in particular? What movies were inspiring that? I mean, the series Outlander, the first oh, yeah. season. Totally. First yeah. season <laughs> when Claire must get oil of lavender. And I yeah. was just like, what? What? <laughs> what do you do with that? Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there were little threads over time, just tiny little threads that wove themselves really for me to a point where I, I basically, I, in my twenties, it was like blog culture was a big thing. And so I just started a blog called the Dabalus where I dabbled and made things. And it just, the whisper became a roar. And Mm -hmm. so all of a sudden I wanted to hike and camp and all of a sudden I wanted to just fall asleep under a tree. And it moved quickly. It snowballed in a way to me realizing and having just visions, both waking and sleeping visions of uh, folks gathered around a table, hearth lit, remembering how to birth babies and make healing soup and respect for elders. And all of a sudden ancestral ways was the way. And Mm -hmm. yeah, it completely shifted everything to focus on that. Very cool. So then what pressed you to write your book, Root and Ritual? Yeah, well, uh, I have to also come clean and say that at first I wanted to write a book and I'd ask myself why. See, you're coming out with a book too. So I feel like, yeah, let's jam (laughs) on this. Uh, I remember I was laying in bed with my partner and I said, I want to write a book. And he said, what about? And I said, I don't even know. I just want to write a book. And that began this whole like, why? Is it just fame? Did I see it as like, do I, did I need to be seen in some way? Did I need to feel credible in some way? Was it for like my dad to see me different? Like all this 
deeper work of the why. I also have a lineage story on my maternal line of women who wanted to write books and never did. Mm. My grandmother, her whole life talked about writing uh, and never could. And it very much frustrated my mom who self-published her own book on mm. word processing in 1981. Cool. Uh, yeah. So, and now my grandmother has passed and um, I just feel like I was in a soul contract with her finishing that. Mm -hmm. So there's that side. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other side of like, I have had this existential ache of loneliness and unbelonging my entire life. And a feeling of severing of my indig indigeneity, of being the cultureless white girl, and a feeling of being drawn to ancestral ways, and just all the turmoil and growth and healing in that. And I wanted to share that. And every time I did share it, whether it was on blog post or um, podcast, I would just get a lot of like, whoa, you too? Like this whole thing where I was excited about the lemons and really interested in what was in my tea bag. Uh, other people are feeling that way. And I, I wanted to present it in a way that wasn't like 10 steps to belonging because that literally can't happen. Mm -hmm. I wanted to share a pathway for folks. So yeah. Since you brought it up, um, how would you distill why that can't happen? The 10 steps to belonging. Like, I'd love to just hear you yeah. jam a little bit on um, the, dangers of being a cultureless white girl being like, Hey, yeah. this is how you belong. You just go back to the land. Like, and I know, you know, in my own book, uh, like you, they only give you so many words and so many pages and you're trying to talk about things that actually re require hours and hours and like lots of, um, thoughtfulness and, uh, listening, listening to, to, mm elders listening to the lived experience of people who are not cultureless white people. And then you, it comes to the book and you're like, how do I mm -hmm. get this mm -hmm. across in the, you know, 700 words they're giving me for this particular section. So if you were to distill that down, like why can't there be a book uh, for white women on 10 steps to belonging? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, it was a challenge in the writing. <laughs> you know, we're talking offline about editing. <laughs> editing down is so difficult. Yeah, and there's a lot of, as I grow older, um, yeah, you have to be with, be with uh, emotions, concepts. Uh, and we are in a culture that wants to like instantly gratify and move forward. And so in my, the beginning of my, when I first heard the calling and dove in, I, I was quite harmful. So again, this is really born of my story. I, I was unconsciously and unintentionally <laughs> and yet harmful in my desperate, like it was like a, a, a hunger, an insatiable hunger to fill this void that I could finally name, right? Unbelonging. Um, and so when you often look to ancestral or indigenous ways, that is often of marginalized folks who have often at their own detriment worked very hard to preserve these ways in order to survive. And many of our indigenous ways have barely, if not, like have barely survived. And a lot of us are using gnosis to bring them back, you know? And, um, Can you define that for uh, listeners who aren't familiar with the term gnosis? Yeah. G-N-O-S-I-S. Yeah, I was going to spell it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Attuning in a spiritual attunement um, to calling these ways back in through your body and through your soul, throwing, going back in. So like sitting on the land and asking the land, like, what do you have to share with me or spirit or whatever words, ancestors, whatever words it is, because it's not written or there's mm -hmm. not oral tradition passed down because it's been, those people have been burned or mm -hmm. those texts have been burned or whatever it is, or there was never any written word or ability to read. And so. Mm -hmm. um, I like dot, to think dot, of dot. Gnosis as like uh, knowledge you've earned on your own. 
Like, mm. but it's, it's, it's knowledge that's come to you directly with no intermediary. It's like you, you the plant told you, the rock told you, mm -hmm. your dream life told you that kind of thing. And maybe that is parallel to, or not exactly what you're pointing at, but I think incorporates in that just for listeners who are like, what is this gnosis thing? Or like, what are the Gnostic practices? It's like, yeah, mm. it's like stuff that you have directly been in relationship with and has come to you uh, unmediated. Mm. Yeah. Some people say I've received a download. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's a Gnostic practice. Right. Yeah. 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 Or in divination. Sorry, I yeah. you. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. Um, so where was I? Well, you, so you were having these, this awareness oh, that mm -hmm. the practices that are, you know, quote unquote, indigenous to say European heritage that, that even we have um, very little to go on. And so yes. there's, it's a Gnostic practice to, to um, try to actually instead, I think what you were saying was like to try to live the way your ancestors did, which was in reciprocal relationship. Yes. And so before I found that, I mm -hmm. looked to other indigenous practices, ways of life that weren't directly related to my own. And I, I had no blessing from a teacher. I was not in study, in a re reciprocal study. I was not a committed apprenticeship. I was reading and doing, which I think is very much of my m millennial culture, <laughs> um, particularly of of like on the internet, spouting and things on, learning them and spouting them quickly. Um, yeah, I had a teacher call me out and say like, hey, you haven't sat with this long enough to really, and like what? you haven't honored the lineage of this. And so that was really important for me to go through, for me to realize like, oh, there's deeper work to be done here around um, understanding belonging. And so I think belonging is an onion, you know, that there's layers we just continuously peel. And it's not that I'll always feel lonely and not belonging, but rather – uh, there's deeper and deeper layers to go through. So no, there's no book, 10 Steps to Belonging, but there is the path to start to even understand what that feels like and beautiful, incredible moments where you feel like the, the threads of belonging weave through you. Uh, but in this idea of if we're privileged enough to like achieve eldership, like maybe – if I'm able to be like an elder on my rocking chair somewhere that is like climate safe, that <laughs> I can say like, oh, I, I get it. I get it in a deeper way than I do now. <laughs> and so making peace with um, letting go of the instant gratification and the perfectionism that I'm always trying to rid myself of and be in this practice of belonging. Mm. As you were describing yourself on the rocking chair in some place, climate safe, which I have to presume is the other world because I can't yeah. see it being this world, but right. but I appreciate the vision, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, so we imagine ourselves and then we work towards building what that could be. Um, and this, I think, starts to bridge pretty well to my next question. You bring up in your book this concept of mythic time. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, I have to credit Amber Magnolia Hill, who has an amazing podcast called Medicine Stories, for planting this seed of understanding um, that this, in our language, our primary language of English, there's tenses, past, present, future, and that in many indigenous languages and probably our indigenous languages, which we've lost, um, it is tenseless. So this idea of of time not being linear, uh, which is like a meme now, like time isn't linear, but like that's actually a pretty intense concept to fully wrap your brain around. Um, so I like this idea of mythic time being like things are ever happening. Something about that phrase feels really powerful. Things are ever happening. And if we can look at, so I use this example in the book, like 
A long time ago, my ancestors immigrated because of a famine. To rephrase that, to say, a long time ago, my ancestors are immigrating because of a famine. There is a way that brings that as ever happening now. And what that can do is create a deeper connection to this this spiral of time, this way that we are all impacting each other. Uh, it it brings it closer because there's a lot, especially for those of us who have um, lineages that really have had a lot of harm done by and to them, there can be a separation. There can be like, well, you know, that was then, this is now. And yet that had an impact, right? Epigenetically, historically, politically, geographically, you know? And so there is a way we need to bring that into our bodies. It's already in our bodies actually. So it's like awakening it in our bodies. And I find this concept of mythic time, um, softens my heart, opens my grief, my rage, my ability to act, my ability to pray, to practice gnosis, right? To all these ways where I can uh, keep myself alive and in this practice of being a better ancestor. And it brings the ancestors closer, doesn't it? Like, yeah. It, that, so this notion of ancestral veneration is not, oh, this is a thing that I do and it's symbolic. It's yeah. like, no, no, if we you know, whether we're looking at it, uh, biologically is this, there's something epigenetic alive in me, in my lineage with Helena or Velda, or, you know, my Mm -hmm. mitochondrial Eve, or even my great, great, great grandmother, or, you know, the, it, and so they are much more alive when we can bring them alive through that, um, shift in perspective, Um, It works on many levels, not just Mm. spiritual. So in your chapter on lineage, you provide a journal prompt. And this is what it is. Using mythic time, what stories from your lineage are ever happening? In what ways has your ancestral past repeated itself? So Becca, what can you share about your own answer to that question? Mm. I participate in a modality called Family Constellation. Oh, yeah. Uh, I find it to be incredibly helpful. Uh, its origins are Southern Africa, brought uh, into post World War II Germany by a man named Bert Hellinger to help heal a great deal of trauma, uh, and then brought to um, North America. And I bring this up to say that that family constellation is a practice that has helped me really see the ever happening of ancestral patterns. And uh, just briefly, because there might be some people like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the family constantly, I don't know if maybe you've talked about it in past episodes. I haven't though. I've, I, I've done it many times. Yeah, and cool. I have friends who are uh, very experienced practitioners and my, oh, my wow. friend is actually, uh, my friend Therese Couture, who's a dear friend of mine, is in contact with the uh, direct ancestor, either the daughter or granddaughter of the um, person in Africa, Southern Africa, who taught Hellinger. (gasps) He went, yes. So (sighs) she has a direct mentor in the roots of this lineage. But anyway, so I'm like kind of waiting for her to – you know, learn more and deepen that relationship. Because I've always said, if there was like another modality I was going to add, it would be facilitating family constellations, but I'm going to like wait and see. But it's like, wow, a living descendant who remembers Hellinger coming to their community. Yeah. So, okay. Please explain what it is. Right. So let's start with Hellinger coming to their community. Yeah. So, (laughs) um, I've learned this through my teacher, um, grandmother, Sarah McLean Bicknell out of Seattle. So, um, you know, there's some oral things here, so I'm hoping I'm right, uh, is that in this community, uh, this tribe, uh, when there would be a conflict that came up between community members, the whole community would come and sit in a circle and community members would be chosen to come in onto the field, which is a Hellinger term, um, the area in the circle and embody an element of that conflict and the community would not complete or disperse until there was resolution. 
So in the practice that you and I have been a part of, there is a field. Wherever I am, it's usually a big rug or a big patch of grass. And there is a seeker, someone who comes to the facilitator with some sort of pattern, problem, um, grievance. And the facilitator brings on people, usually the not known to the seeker, to represent elements of their lineage. And it, it, they could represent a father, the person themselves. It could represent the country of Italy. It could represent sexual trauma. And it's a very somatic experience. So it's not so much about acting out. It's about feeling in your body and moving as different members or elements of the, I'll just say problem, the experience are brought onto the field. And then there's something called healing sentences that happen where um, members of this lineage speak to each other. And it's a wild experience to be a seeker. I was a seeker three it's weeks ago. Wild. Oh, wow. It's, yeah. And it's, it's a wild experience to be an observer holding the it's, field. It's a wild experience to be chosen to be a representation yeah. of something in the field. You don't know a person and suddenly you know, you just, it, yes. it's hard to explain. And it, it sounds um, so far out there, but then when you're there and you're in it, it the, 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 it's so palpable, the ever happening is happening right before your eyes. Right it's before so your eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, just three weeks ago we did, so this is what I wanted to share, is uh, I brought to the facilitator uh, a feeling of being unsafe around drunk men. I'm interested in wondering from like a ever happening perspective why I feel unsafe around drunk men and it prevents me from feeling deeper intimacy with men. And we did, we let the field, we just let it go and we watched what happened. And to see my maternal grandmother, this woman who I've never met, become my grandmother and speak to just like certain pains in her hands and just wild. But um, what I realized is ever happening in my lineage from that particular constellation was women with really unstable and frazzled nervous systems hmm. as a direct result of things like electric shock therapy in the 1960s and um, alcohol abuse, either trying to numb or being just like blown out and hmm. how I myself really do feel that. I feel real sensitivity and discomfort um, and so one thing that triggers that is drunk men, you know, but there wasn't, there's an element here of, of my mother feeling it, my grandmother feeling it, my great grandmother feeling it. Um, and other members of my family we've talked to who feel it. So that's something I can work with, right? What is ever happening is these women's nervous systems do not feel grounded, do not feel regulated. And that's something I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And how did you feel after the constellation? How how did how are you working with it since that awareness? Well, in the constellation, there was some giving back of trauma, and there was some working with the nervous system itself, speaking mm -hmm. to it, soothing it. Um, and so I have my own practice of when I feel that sort of now I feel like it's electric shock therapy that's helped me of like a lightning move through me as I, I just, I say, it's not mine. I give it back up the line. It's not mine. Mm -hmm. I give it back up the line. And that's a practice I have now. And I also, I think the beauty of constellation work is to, is to know that all of our, I'm not just working on it on my own, mm -hmm. that we were all there on the field and that mm -hmm. the field is everywhere. And so, um, we're all holding hands. That's I like that feeling. Mm. We're all holding hands, working through this together mm. for as long as it takes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in mythic time, sometimes it doesn't take any time at all. Other times right. it's like little bits of this. These echoes will carry infinitely, but um, there's it's, it can be a pretty miraculous space. Would you be willing to share some of the rituals you did to honor your rite of passage into motherhood. You offer many rituals in the book and mm. um, 
you know, you, I, you hadn't become a mother at the time of um, submission of the manuscript. It didn't sound like. So um, what were some of the things you did for that? Mm. Yeah, I got pregnant and got the book deal in the same week. And then okay. they were due the same week. <laughs> so <laughs> Wow. I did this very much with, uh, yeah, with my daughter at the same time. <laughs> um, wouldn't recommend it, but did it anyways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was a COVID pregnancy and really felt, uh, because there was a real, um, right discouragement of gathering, a real loss, real grief, rage, anger. At, um, not getting the rite of passage I had been dreaming of for years. It took me quite a long time to have a baby. And uh, so I was thinking about ways I could do it on my own. And I, I just like sent out a message to my beloved community and said, how can we do this in a way that feels good and safe and of consent? And um, because I need, I need this, I need to be witnessed in this, I now know the term matrescence, right? But this very major life transition, identity shift. And so we did an outdoor mast, half the people on Zoom, half the people there. Um, Mother blessing, where I, I shared my fears around the birth and around motherhood. And I had friends speak it aloud as they sprinkled um, Celtic sea salt into a bowl of water. And then um, they dumped the water on me, <laughs> I think, to shock me because I was really crying, crying, hearing all these fears to try to shock me. Um, the same teacher, Grandmother Sarah McLean Bicknell, was there leading it. And she really wanted me to be in like a pattern change, to be ready. Mm. And then my mother was there holding a picture of my grandmother, the ones I'd been working with in Constellation. And she spoke aloud my birth story as I faced her. And we held hands, and then um, I turned away, said goodbye to that mother-daughter feeling, and walked through a tunnel of roses that my friends held up, the birth canal of me, right? Aww. Yeah, it was, like, mm-hmm. so great. <laughs> and because we all were like, we need ritual together. <laughs> it really went all out, you know? Yeah. We had been months, right? Yeah. And then stepping into, like, a – flower strewn circle of me and my child. Uh, and then having every member of my community come up and bless us in some way with hopes and desires for us. It was really, really powerful reading John Donahue, O'Donohue, just like great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so that was really special and powerful. And I remember I shared it uh, out on social media and there was a real resonance there. Mm-hmm. And then since I've become a mother, which has been um, rocked my world <laughs> in a major way of now embodying the identity shift that I was ritualizing before I've had a lot of hair ritual practice Mm -hmm. because the hair falling out is a very common thing, um, which is I've learned actually just new hair growth. So there's a lot of energy in moving a baby out of the body. And so a lot of cells die at the same time, a lot of new cells um, are born. And so I was brushing my hair and just clumps of hair coming out and Mm. I refused to be horrified. I thought what a beautiful opportunity to say goodbye to the the cells of my old self. Mm. And so I've been burying my hair uh, in my garden, the land I live on. And then I had a friend, Aluna, say, oh, you're burying your old self and giving it to the mycelium to create new life. Beautiful. And saying, and like they're the ancestor's bones of the land you lived on. And so that has felt really beautiful. So I did a one big one once, but I found that wasn't enough. So I frequently just pull the hair out of my brush and walk outside. Mm. Say, hi, here Mm. she is. Take good care. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's beautiful and so then what will you do to ceremonially step into the fullness of your identity as uh, author 
as your book is out in the world? I don't know. I've been thinking. <laughs> I mean, just to be really honest, I it's very out of body for me still. I think because it's like a many year process, right? As you know, like the creation of the proposal and then you get the deal and then you write and then you wait and then you edit and then you wait. And so it's been like three years Mm -hmm. Uh, and I have changed so much in that process. It might be different if I didn't have like a massive life transition in the middle. Um, So, you know, I wanted to say like, I actually do want to like wear a turtleneck and glasses and put a sweater (laughs) over my shoulders and like have a reading in front of a fire. (laughs) Like yeah, <laughs> like a little bit tongue in cheek, but also I feel like that could actually be a really fun embodiment <laughs> practice. Right, right. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I wonder if you have ideas for yourself, or because I, I have struggled with being like this is real, like patting my body and saying this is this. I add this to my identity list, author. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I have no ideas. I don't identify yeah. as a writer and I don't know that I'll ever, I mean, I guess I'll have to technically identify as an author, but I, I'm sure I'll never identify as a writer. I say that now. Really? Like, I, yeah, no, I know writers. Uh, <laughs> actually, like, same, same. Right? No, I know like quote unquote real writers and um, yeah, it's a different this is not breed. that. Yeah. yeah. I actually had a, a Yesterday was my birthday and I had this amazing day. Uh, and one of just one little thing that happened that felt like the gods were like basically partying with me all day was I went into this thrift shop and there was this large mounted poster there that was in French, all the aphorisms of Bria Savarin. And I was like, <gasps> oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing. I need to have this in my kitchen. I was like so excited. And I'd already been like very chatty with the the two women working there, just like complimenting their staging and displays in the window and stuff. So when I brought it up, I was like, this is the best. I just was like given a, a birthday present from the heavens that I came in here and this is for me. And they're like, oh, this is so interesting. Like it's in French. Do you speak French? And I was like, well, I, I speak it well enough to understand what this is saying, but I'm also pretty familiar with the the, the person who wrote them. Mm. And they were like, oh, like who were they? And I said, uh, oh, Bria Savarin. They said, oh, were they, uh, what, what is this about? And I was like, oh, it's all, I'm going to hang it in my kitchen. It's all about food and like how nourishment uh, is like the foundation of a culture and how the culture, the inner culture of the individual all the way up to the nation state. Tell me mm-hmm. what you eat. I'll tell you who you are. And um, they were like, oh, is he a chef? And I said, no, actually, he was uh, a philosopher of food, an epicure, you know, what the French would call a gastronome. He, he, he wrote a lot of things about the the intersection of food and culture and human making through nourishment. And then I was like, and they were like, what? And I was like, oh my God, that's what I am. I'm a gastronome. Oh my God. And then I like left the store Googling, am I using that term right? And and I was, and I was like, that, see, I don't uh, identify as a chef either. Hmm. So the idea of like, I've written a cookbook that's a a, sort of a spiritual treatise on animism, et cetera. I'm like, yeah, I, I identify neither as a chef nor as a writer. And yet these <laughs> things have technically occurred, but I do identify as a gastronome. So I, I and, and <sighs> I, and I probably will identify as an author, but that feels different from writer. For yeah. Me. So I'll have to think about that. I don't know what the rituals will be for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, as we're coming to the end of the show, I'd like to ask you, and this could include ritual or it could just be like the, the stuff you do when you're like not into ritual, when you're just like not up for it, you're really yeah. in the moment. Um, so the range, of course, uh, the, the final question on the podcast is always the same. So Becca, how do you cope with grief and rage? Mm-hmm. Well, can't stop talking about it. Can't stop talking about those things in these times. So I think talk about it obsessively with anyone who will want to talk about it with me. (laughs) Right. Like, where are the keeners? Where are the keeners? (laughs) 
<laughs> we right. need to wail collectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I eat. I mm -hmm. eat. Speaking of food as human making, I pick fights with my partner until I realize <laughs> I need to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on the ritual side, I mean, I witnessing is such an important part of my life. I'm really grateful I caught on and I caught on to how important that is and healed a lot of my um, shitty listening abilities mm -hmm. to really understand what it means to fully empty, to have empty presence and to fully receive another one's truth and to see them as like the champion of their own story. Uh, and it's so beautiful to be on the receiving end of that. So I think when I am feeling particularly grief or rage. I have a women's circle that has met every new moon for the past eight years. I bring it there. Mm -hmm. And we've deepened so much in our agreements and our, and our container that I can really go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes, you know, it's like the raw truth, you know, that can shake another's bones and trigger even, you know, just like it's nice to be able to have a, container that feels like it can hold it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I take a lot of baths. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the container that can hold it, it doesn't surprise me that it, uh, not that it necessarily took eight years to get there, but that, you know, oh. it does take some years, right? You, you gotta, yes. you gotta put stuff in and people change tremendously and we don't always meet and match each other in a oh, yeah. symbiotic way <laughs> for that whole time and you know being able to like go the distance whatever the distance is is um pretty incredible but it's not something you just like fall into i don't, I don't know about you but like speaking yeah. of unbelonging those people who are like oh i went on a vacation with my 10 best friends i'm like do i have 10 people in my phone like i don't mm. what, are, what are you talking about 10 best friends you know so those things they it they take some time to 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 cultivate that that kind of um, container. So kudos to you. Oh yeah, I mean, coming back to going back to like instant gratification culture. I think, um, just like sister circle culture is really interesting to me because one of one of I have four sections in the book. And the third one is on community. And I talk about it in this way of mostly encouraging people to get started. And I think that that's level, layer one. And layer two is really talking about like, it's really hard. Re re like relating healthily is actually requires digging deep and training, you know, and therapy, you know, and not to be like, you, we can't do it. It's It should be accessible to all of us. But this particular circle of women, I mean, there's at, le at least once, I'm, or I should say all of us at least once have wanted to flee, mm -hmm. you know, really flee. I mean, there have been hurts. There have been, there's been harm. I mean, we're so committed to repair and there are times I've been so uncomfortable in it. Uh, but yeah, it takes digging deep to really stick it out either in a circle or with one other person mm -hmm. because there's just been a lot of unhealthy modeling, mm -hmm. particularly in our parents and our grandparents' generations, going back even further. So, uh, and I know you do a lot of this work too. It just takes intention and patience and devotion. Yeah, devotion for sure. Devotion for sure. Well, thank you for sharing everything you've shared on the show today. And thank you so much for making a start with your work of uh, bringing devotion into um, a conversation that's accessible for people. And um, do you have any follow-up plans? You had like, the first book was like, I want to write a book I don't know what about. Yeah. <laughs> do you have any other inclination like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now I've, yeah, I need time uh, <laughs> to recover and integrate, right? Because something that has really occurred to me over the last few years is just like the slow life is the way. Uh, but I think, yeah, major life transitions is what's got me mm. curious and open. Rites of passage, 
all of it, particularly in a time of upheaval and collapse. I think there's a lot to do there, but I'm not going to rush it. <laughs> good, good call. Well, thanks so much for being on the show today, Becca. It's been a joy getting to know you. Yeah, thank you. The book drops on Tuesday, November 16th. Ask your local independent bookseller to stock Root and Ritual by Becca Piastrelli so others can discover it. And then please leave a review on Amazon. Hey, I know we all mm, despise billionaires with a white hot passion, but authors really do need to get good traction with Amazon reviews because that signals to publishers, the people who paid them to write the book, that they should give them another contract to keep writing more books. I know. It sucks to be involved in any way in that soul-sucking, civilization-destroying megacorp. I get it. But thank you for supporting emerging authors, and thank you for your positive reviews and well wishes. It's hugely appreciated by the little guys. Find this episode's show notes with links to Becca's website at numinouspodcast.com. Okay, listener shout out. Thank you, listeners in Pakistan. I've got my eye on you, you know. There were like one or two listeners in Pakistan for like years. And now there are five of you. Are you all friends? You should be friends. I want that to be the case. So, hey, everyone. I wanted to say hello to my listeners in Pakistan in their indigenous language. Uh, and then I learned something very interesting. I already had a sense that probably an official language was uh, English because colonization. Um, but then I learned that there are two official languages, Urdu and English, but actually only 8% of the population speaks Urdu. Um, most Pakistanis speak it as a second language. Um, however, there are plans to abolish English as an official language. But when you go down through the list of how many indigenous languages there are in Pakistan, there's over 75, which coming from Coast Salish territory isn't so shocking in a way. Um, you know, the, the Coast Salish refers to a language family that has at least two dozen distinct languages and many, many more dialects just within itself. Um, so uh, just where I live in what's called like Southwest Canada, Pacific Northwest uh, America, I, I get having many, many languages. Um, but still, I was, I was quite shocked to learn. Uh, how many languages there were in Pakistan. So I'm just going to say, thanks, five of you. It's like super delightful to me to think of you over there listening. Love that. Okay, so this is like the last time I want to say this on the podcast, at least in this way. I just want to give you an update in case you've missed it, or if you're not on my newsletter, or if you're like new to my world. Um, I don't sell my courses and workshops as individual offerings, not any more friends. I know some of you have come to certain workshops every year for like 10 years, but that's not how I'm doing it anymore. Not because I'm not running courses and workshops. I absolutely am. But during the pandemic, I saw that most people, um, they just really were under-resourced uh, with mental health supports and also financial means. So in response, I've bundled all my offerings into one simple, accessible price, and it's less than half my hourly rate, and it's far less than you'd ever spend to have a live workshop with me. So that's how you can do my courses, my workshops, um, and all the upcoming stuff for Yuletide is by joining the Numinous Network. So yes, this holiday season, I'll once again be doing my 12 Days of Yuletide Folk Celebrations. It's formerly known as the Yuletide Stocking Stuffer. So it's 12 daily micro rituals and mini meditations that you can easily fit into your busy day. You could even do it as a family. It's super family friendly and all the rituals are really simple and you, you might not even think of it as a ritual. You think of it as like a micro ritual. It starts December 18th. We'll have a special live event, but it'll be recorded. It's under the full moon. It's all about filling your cup with soothing self-care dosing the field with spiritual connection and safeness. And then from solstice to New Year's Day, every day you'll be guided through some folk practices and self-directed rituals to bring sacred intention and meaning. So you're creating holiday traditions of your own. 
So it's good to end the year well. I'd love to do it together. The only place to find it is at the Numinous Network. So just join for like a month or two. And you can binge on all my offerings over the holidays, like Netflix, but with more co-regulation. So come and join for the one workshop or course you wanted, or just the Yuletide stocking stuffer, but you'll get the whole rest of the network and all my other offerings as a bonus. It's really great. You'll find all the details at carmenspaniola.com. C-A-R-M-E-N-S-P-A-G-N-O-L-A. Until next time, take care.